people. Welcome back to another edition of Gen Sports Corner for Tuesday, December 6, 2022. You see the title. We're going to get right into it. Yo, big, big signing this week by the Philadelphia Phillies. Made news. <clears throat> we had the big win with uh, A.J. Brown having the revenge game over the Titans. And then you come back a day or two later and you have the big splash signing of one Mr. Trey Turner being signed to an 11-year, $300 million deal to the Philadelphia Phillies. And that changes a lot, man. We're trying to get back to this World Series. And they had holes to fill. They had to address their defense. And they had to get more consistent with hitting. And they did that by getting one of the big-name free agents. Now, mind you, they had Xander Bogarts. You had Carlos Correa. You had Dansby Swanson. And you had Trey Turner, who, in my opinion, was probably – overall pound for pound the best out of the four between him and Carlos Correa and he went out and got him man now let's go ahead and, and look in, into some of the things that he brings to the table let me know what you guys think in the comments below if you're happy with the signing or, or not and I'll give you the numbers so you see exactly what type of animal is coming to Philadelphia with this lineup this lineup man so let's talk about it so you have Trey Turner here young dude 29 years old well he just turned He's turning 30 in 2023, plays shortstop, 6'2", 185 pounds, throws right, bats right from um, Boynton Beach, Florida, but he has a lot of ties to the Philadelphia area and the East Coast. Um, drafted in the first round in 2014 by the Padres, 13th pick in the draft, and then traded to the Washington Nationals, where he played with, guess who, Bryce Harper. They came up together, so they're very familiar, and that's one of the big reasons why he came to Philadelphia, among other reasons. And he got one offer, and that was a big one, and I'll tell you who that was in a second, but let's get to the numbers here. 2022, last year with the Dodgers, he was there for about a year and a half after being traded by Washington, but last year he batted 298 in terms of his batting percentage. His on-base percentage was 343, and his slugging percentage was 466. So his OPS was 809, which is very good. But those don't really tell how good he was. Uh, he hit 21 dingers last year, and then he had 100 RBI, which is really, really good in the heart of that lineup. I believe he was the leadoff batter for the Dodgers, if I'm not mistaken, with that speed. For his career, he's hitting 302, 355 on base percentage, and 487 slugging percentage. So for his career, he has an OPS of 842, which is you're in, you, you are a very, 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 very good player when you're hitting that well. So you need to know about this guy. He brings a solid arm, very, very good defense, a gold glove shortstop. And he can hit for average. He gets on base, he gets on base, he gets on base. And when he gets on base, he punishes you. So let's talk about one of the big reasons why he's going to be such an upgrade to this team. And that's because now, even though it worked last year, you had Kyle Schwarber batting in the leadoff spot, which is a little bit unorthodox. Having a guy who doesn't have great wheels and who's a power guy, but who's very patient. And that's why it worked out for you. But now you have Trey Turner here who not only can hit for average, but he doesn't strike out as much. And he's a blazer. He's a speed demon on the bases. So let's go ahead and look deeper into the numbers here. So last year, like I said, Trey Turner had an on-base percentage of 343 to Kyle Schwarber's 323. The NLB average was 320. So they're both doing good getting on base. Turner was be better. Kyle Schwarber got on base because he had walks. He walked a lot more. So the league average is 64 walks. Trey Turner only had 45, but Schwarber had 86 walks. And he was seeing the second most pitches per bat of any MLB player with 4.31 pitches per at bat when the MLB average was 389. And Turner was right at the average with 384. However, Turner almost had just as many extra base hits, 64 to 70 for Schwarber, where the average is 55, but he struck out 69 less times. Hell of a number, right? Where the MLB average is 150, Turner only struck out 131 times, where Schwarber, I believe, he was first or second in the league with 200 strikeouts, being a leadoff batter, but still getting on base because of all of the walks. But stolen bases last year, Trey Turner had 27, Kyle Schwarber had 10, <laughs> right? So you're talking about a guy that's a speed demon. When he gets on base, he punishes you, man. He's always going to be on the pitcher's mind. He's going to really put you to work. 
So you look at some of the deeper numbers when I mentioned that speed. 27 stolen bases last year, but you look at really how fast this guy is. And here's one stat to know, and it's called Bolt. And this is a stat cast term for base running play in which a runner reaches a threshold for elite speed. And that means that going from home to second, you are tracking an average of 30 feet per second, which means you're freaking blazing around the base path. And since 2015, when they started tracking it, he's racked up an astonishing 724 bolts. The next closest competitor, and he played on the Phillies and the Nationals, to my to my belief, is Cesar Hernandez with 448. Now, on top of that, think that Trey Turner didn't even play his first full season in 2018. So the fact that he, you have that gap of how many more bolts he had, even though he's played a shorter amount of time, is really just astonishing to me. And you look over the past seven years from 2015 to 2022, Every year, his average sprint speed has been over 30 feet per second. 30.7 feet per second in 2015 when he was a rookie. 30.7 feet per second in 2021. And then 30.3 feet per second in 2022. He's running as fast as he was as a rookie. And he's going into his prime. That will be average pace is 27 feet per second. So it shows you how much... Further ahead in terms of speed, he is than everybody else. I mean, he he's he's running at a different speed, literally, figuratively, and literally, he's running at a different speed. So once he gets on base, you're going to have a guy who's going to be able to open up things for you offensively. This Phillies team did not have a lot of speed, if any, around the bases, and now you got one of, if not the fastest guy in baseball, who also hits for average. So that's really going to open that, that offense. And when I look at how this lineup can look, this is what I imagine. So I imagine you have Trey Turner leading off at the top. So now you can move Kyle Schwarber back to that cleanup spot. So I, I, I think Trey Turner at the one spot. And I want to go ahead and, and look here at how I had the lineup set up. Let's see. How do I have this set up in my mind? You can never find things when you're looking for them, right? So Trey Turner in the leadoff spot, and then in that two spot, I would have um, JT Real Muto, and then in three spot, in the fourth spot, I think depending on how you want to have it, it could either be Bryce at three, and then Schwarber at four in the DH spot, or it could be Schwarber at three, and then Bryce at four. Either way, you got two guys that are very patient. I mean, obviously Schwarber's more patient than Har Harper, but... They see the ball very well, and if you got guys on base like Trey Turner and JT who can get on base and he has good speed, you're going to see a lot more fastballs. And what happens when you throw fastballs to a guy like Kyle Schwarber or Bryce Harper is going to be trouble, right? So they're going to see a lot of pitches. You think Kyle Schwarber already sees a lot of pitches? He's going to see a hell of a lot more pitches now, and guys aren't going to want to throw to him straight up. You got one or two guys on base with Bryce Harper and or Kyle Schwarber. Kyle Schwarber had 45 home runs last year. Imagine how many RBIs that he missed out on or out on because he was in the leadoff spot versus being at the 3, 4, or 5 spot. So I think his RBIs are going to go up. He's going to see better pitches. He already was a great leadoff man. He's going to be even better in that cleanup spot now. So that's the way I envision the lineup looking. So I'm very excited about this. Let me know what you guys think about that. So I think they addressed a big need at shortstop. And then I think one of the other two needs that they need to address are the bullpen and then starting pitcher. So what's going on in the starting pitching market? And unfortunately, it's not great news for the, for the Phillies. Justin Verlander signed a two-year deal with a third-year vesting option with the Mets. The Mets, Mets just lost Jacob DeGrom. He went and got a big five-year deal, 185 mil with the with the uh, Rangers. So they replaced him with Verlander, and then the other big free agent target would be Mr. Carlos Rodon. And I don't know, he might be still being played for the Mets. I think the Mets are trying to stack up again and keep that pitching rotation at an elite level. So I think the Mets and the Dodgers are at play. You got to watch out for them. But that's I think the guy that is on their radar. But the Yankees are the big market team that's most focused on him. And this is a report that I'm reading off of phillyvoice.com. 
So the word is he's seeking six mil, six years at more than 30 million following that big year he had last year in San Fran. So you're talking about a guy who's throwing anywhere from 97 to 99 on a good day consistently and has a good breaking pitch to to add on to that. So he's really hard to hit. He had a 2.88 ERA last year, 14 and 8. He's a dog, man. 29, coming into his prime. I mean, those are the type of guys you want to add to the top of this rotation with Zach Wheeler and Aaron Nola. I don't know if they're going to be able to get a guy like that. But, you know, if they don't, then you have to look at the second tier guys. I think they're letting the top of the market clear out right now. I think Trey Turner was their guy. They were going to try to go for a guy like Radon if they could get him. It might not happen. And then you look for that next tier of guys. Uh, Jamison Tyon, maybe he goes to another team in the NL East. That's in the second tier of guys. They might not get him. So are they going to get another arm? Or are they going to expect one of those young guys like Mick Abel or any of the other guys in the system to step up? Even if it's a young guy stepping up, I still think it's a it's a slight improvement. But it's not exactly what you you would like, ideally. Right? And even so, if they don't get the starting pitcher, I still think they need to go and fix that bullpen because you got guys that are inconsistent and you still don't have a closer. Zach Eflin, he's not going to go on a reunion tour. He left out, got a three-year deal, so you know he's out of there. So you have to still figure out what you're going to do at the closer spot. Because I think that's something that they never had an answer for, even all the way up through the World Series Game 6 with the Astros. You never had the guy who could come in and put the clink, clink lockdown on the opposing team. You need some semblance to that. You don't have to have the best guy in baseball, but you have to have, to have a guy that's reliable, serviceable, that when he comes in, you know eight times out of ten he's going to get it done, okay? A blown save here, a blown save there is okay, but it can't be... You can't be blowing 9, 10, 11 saves in the season. It's, it's, it's going to come back to bite you more often than not. So we'll see what they do with that, and I'll keep you, keep you guys updated on that front. But this was the big news. Trey Turner, I, I made a video about Trey Turner, I think, about a month ago. might have been a week or two after the World Series loss, and I mentioned Trey Turner being on the radar, and lo and behold, my, my prophecy and my hopes came true, you know? That was the guy that I wanted. That's the guy that we got. And I'm more than happy, man. You look at this team, not just for the present, but for the future. Look at the core. Look how young they are. All of them in their prime. You're set up to win now and in the future. Now, you don't know where you'll be at five, ten years from now. But even as those guys age, and this is a, a common argument that I hear, even as these guys age, you don't know what pieces you're going to put around them in 2027, 2028, some guys will be here, some will not. But even the guys that get older, they may become a complimentary piece, a la an Albert Pujols or Yadier Molina. When they gave those guys big contracts years ago, right, you think they envisioned that at 40, Albert Pujols would still be putting up, what, 20, 30-plus home runs? He might have even put up 40 this year. Do you think they envisioned that? No, they envisioned a guy who would be at the twilight of his career near the tail end and they could have younger guys around him, but he would still bring that veteran leadership and enough juice to be able to make you a playoff contender and hopefully with younger pieces, a World Series contender. So that's the same idea you have to have when you're making these moves. You know, you hear people say, well, you're giving him a 10 year deal. What's he going to be like when he's 39? It's like, with all due respect, who the hell cares, man? Um, you cross that bridge when you get there. Like I said, when when Trey Turner's 39, there might be two or three contracts that are already off the book. So you're not even worried about the money he's making. Number two, the money he's making now, that might be old news by the time we're at 2028. A $30 million deal for a shortstop might transform into a $50 million a year deal for a shortstop. So it might already be obsolete at that point anyway. I mean, you see the same thing with quarterbacks in the NFL. I remember Derek Carr got a five-year, $125 million deal like three years ago. The going rate for a starting quarterback now, you're looking at guys that are average getting $30 million a year. What do you think Kirk Cousins got? He got paid handsomely, right? And every year, that average number is going to go up and up and up as long as the economy doesn't crash. 
right? So you can't look at it. Obviously, you have to be mindful on how you're allocating your resources and how you're spending that revenue that's coming in. But you also have to take into account inflation and not hamstring yourself mentally over the numbers, okay? Because it's a fluid it's a fluid situation. It's not static. Like just because you have $300 million in the payroll now, I'm not saying it's the number, but let's just say for argument's sake, does not mean that that will be $300 million in 2028 money. That might be, you know, that might be, you, you might, inflation taken out, you might have a payroll of $180 million by the time you get to five years from now, you know, and then you're adding in pieces after that. So, you, you know, it's a fluid. That's why these GMs get paid what they do, man, because you have to have short term vision and long term vision. You're thinking about the numbers as you go. You have to be able to try to strike when the iron's high and win now while still being flexible. That's why Howie Roseman has been one of the best GMs in the NFL in terms of kicking the can down the road while still keeping an eye to the future, which is damn near impossible. But somehow he's figured out a way to make it tenable. So I, I think that the Phillies are in a good spot. And I think that they're gonna have they're gonna have a really good spot to work from next year in this NL East, not just in the East, but in, in the NL period. So let me know what you guys think. I'm gonna post this up on YouTube and I'll be making some some more videos about what the Phillies are thinking about during the winter meetings, what what are some of the rumors coming up. As well as we'll be talking Eagles on the next episode. You know, like I said, they had the big win over the Titans. Now you have a big game coming up against the the Giants. I'll be down there at Xfinity Live partying it up. And I'll have my thoughts on what we're going to do with Saquon and that Giants offense. But, you know, you probably know where I'm leaning. And that's not just because of my hometown affiliations. But, yeah, let me know what you guys think. Uh, like, comment, subscribe to the channel over there on YouTube. We're definitely growing. Um, it's been a, been a big month so far. We've been growing off of the Phillies videos as well as the boxing videos. Um, for all you boxing heads, I've been dropping videos about um, Dimitri Bivol and his big fights he's had with Canelo earlier and then Zerto Ramirez. I dropped a video about the fight coming up next year with Tank Davis and Ryan Garcia. And I have... Uh, more videos coming out with some of the news that's been dropping for boxing. So, yo, make sure you go over and subscribe because I, I'm I'm keeping them cranking out right now. I'm, keep, I'm cranking them out, so you don't want to miss it. Uh, that being said, enjoy your night. Be safe. Um, hopefully, the Sixers will win their next game and not lose like they did that last night. That was uh, uh, that was a tough loss right there. But at least James Harden's back. <laughs> All we need now is Tyrese next. All right, so I'll catch you on the next episode, and it's been real. Peace.